first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Ray, for this uh, opportunity to present here. Um, my name is Rishi Prashad, and I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist in the Department of Crop, Soil, and Environmental Sciences, uh, as well as Animal Science Department. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about sustainability. Uh, that's been a pretty hot topic right now. Everybody talks about sustainability. So let's first start by defining the term sustainability. You know, I looked into some of the definitions online and then found that sustainability is, is considered is, as a pattern of resource use that aims to meet human needs while preserving the environment so that these needs can be met not only in present, but also for future generations. Uh, there's another Another definition of sustainability, which says meeting the needs of the present uh, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, the question is why we want to be sustainable? I mean, why? I mean, and, and if you look around uh, some of the issues that we have, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we face today is the human population. You know, uh, right now we are 7 billion. Uh, by 2050, we will be 9 billion. And in order to for, feed this 9 billion people, the food production has to be increased by 70%. And, and that, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the farmers, the people who produce food, in order to feed uh, this uh, rising population. But at the same time, it also puts tremendous pressure on the environment because agriculture and environment are interconnect, interconnected and, and, and uh, you know, we cannot separate these two things out. Uh, but first, I'd like to define you uh, some of the kinds of pollution as it relates to environment. And, and there are two types of pollution. One we call as point source pollution. And the second is called as the non-point source pollution. So point source pollution, as you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward where you can uh, identify the source of pollution. Like say, for example, if you see a pipe coming out of a affluent, um, from industry discharging affluent, we can point out, and that is called as point source pollution. Same thing, if you see a smoke stack coming from a factory, you can point it and then say that's a point source pollution. But then is, there's other type of pollution where you cannot point out. And, and, and one of that is called as uh, that, and, and that is also considered as diffuse or indirect. And an example of that is the excess fertilizers uh, or the herbicides or the insecticides that comes from the agricultural or residential areas. Uh, similarly, sediments, you know, I mean, they are very difficult to point out. That's why we call them as non-point source of pollution. Uh, I was speaking about agriculture and sustainability and environment. Uh, Unfortunately, there are two nutrients that, that is agriculturally important, but also they are environmental concern and they are nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, plants cannot uh, grow and produce without nitrogen and phosphorus, but excess of these nutrients, when they enter our environment, they cause a whole set of problems. For example, you know, you know, if you see this condition where the water is flowing out of agricultural land, that water dissolves the nutrients and, and they are mostly nitrogen and phosphorus and it runs with the water and, and the water will go somewhere and eventually to creek. So they, this water dumps that nutrient, especially nitrogen and phosphorus in the creek. There's another route of the loss, which is which we call as leaching. So those places or those agricultural fields uh, that are coarse textured, uh, where we have sandy soils, in those areas the water actually goes down uh, the soil profile and and hits the groundwater, and and that becomes a problem in the future. Speaking of water quality, uh, you are very familiar and you have seen this term floating around, which we call as eutrophication, where the, the fresh water body turns green and is full of algae. And the other issue that, that is very prevalent uh, in this modern day is the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. You know, it fish kills and loss of aquatic habitats. And, and, and there are several other issues related to the dead zone uh, issue. So all these water quality problems, they do come from the nutrients um, that, that are coming from several places and eventually coming to these reservoirs. The other important uh, effect 
that these nutrients cause, and especially this nutrient, I'll say nitrogen, that causes problems is the greenhouse gas effect. Uh, you know, we have known carbon dioxide as greenhouse gas effect, but I'll tell you that the nitrogen that comes or uh, evolves as nitrous oxide, I mean, it has 298 times more warming potential than carbon dioxide for over, and, that, then the, and, and the effect remains for 100 years. The other problem with the nitrous oxide, it causes the depletion of ozone. And you all know that how important the ozone is. Actually, it helps uh, keep the UV rays, uh, you know, from re reaching out to the, to the earth. According to estimate, uh, one of the estimate that came from the uh, National Proceedings of, uh, uh, Proceedings of uh, um, uh, Agricultural Sciences, um, they say that the Midwest alone, you know, from corn and soybean rotation, we, uh, they release almost eight kilograms of nitrox, ox, nitrous oxide per hectare per year. Uh, so you can multiply that number with the number of uh, hectares or acres that we have in agriculture, and you can imagine the amount of nitrous oxide that's, that is released from agricultural lands and, and, and then contributing to the greenhouse gas, uh, which will have tremendous effect in future. So we need to be thinking about, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, that how we can control uh, the release or, or the movement of these nutrients, which we specifically call, it, call them as non-point source into our water or air. Uh, of course, you know, because of this environmental pollution, we have several laws and regulations in place. And these laws and regulations will become strict uh, in future, you know, because the demand for food is going to put tremendous pressure in environment and, and in order to make the checks and balances, uh, these regulations are going to play a big role on that. So the question is, you know, how can we manage these nutrients and become a good environmental steward? and at the same time prevent the loss of these nutrients into, into the environment. So if we look into the sources of nutrients, there are three important sources of nutrients in agricultural system. I mean, the first one is of course the native soil that has organic matter and they provide nutrients to the plants. The second source of nutrient is the synthetic fertilizer, the commercial fertilizer that, that many people apply. And the third important source of nutrient is the manure or compost that we typically apply on agricultural lands. So we need to be thinking about that, how do we manage the three different forms of, uh, or, or the source of nutrients that is being applied to agricultural land. Uh, we often describe uh, the, the interjection or prevention of these nutrients through a practice which we call as agricultural best management practice. In short form, they are called as BMPs. Um, you know, I was trying to look up for a definition and I found, uh, and actually I like this, um, the, the definition given by Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, they define BMP as um, laws or it is, it is defined as uh, by law as a means or practice of combination of practices uh, determined by the coordinating, coordinating agencies based on research, field testing, and expert review to be the most effective and practical on location means, including economic and technological considerations for improving water quality in agricultural and urban discharges. I mean, so BMPs are truly very effective in reducing the nutrient losses. So let's talk about some of these BMPs. I mean, what are some of the BMP that a farmer can use or apply to his operation and, and manage these nutrients and, and be a good environmental steward? The first and foremost BMP is soil test. You know, soil test, is, is pretty simple and, and any person can go and collect soil samples and send to a soil testing lab. And then the soil testing lab, what they do is they classify these nutrients in different fertility status or rankings. You know, if, if say for example, your soil falls under a very low category, it means that it can be benefited if you apply fertilizer. But if say for example, uh, if your soil falls under an extremely high 
category, uh, there will be no benefit of adding any fertilizer. Uh, so why we want to waste money and then at the same time, uh, it's gonna cause environmental concerns. The next BMP is extremely important and it's very emerging these days because of the advent of the digital agriculture, you know, and the precision farming. Uh, say, for example, you know, this piece of land that you see that there are different colors in red and green and light green. Uh, you know, if you pull soil samples in a coordinated fashion in a grid, grid pattern, and when you lay the soil test result, you will come up with this uh, map, which we call as spatial fertility map, right? And when you look at this map, you see that there are certain areas in the red, which falls under extremely high or very high category. Whereas there are areas in this map, which falls under low or medium to high category, right? Now, the question is, if we have to apply fertilizer uniformly throughout the field, of course, we, you know, we get, get benefited uh, from fertilizer application in all those areas that are low. But then, you know, those areas which are very high or extremely high, uh, even if you apply fertilizer, I mean, there's no agronomic benefit of this additional fertilizer, but it can cause problems, especially from an environmental standpoint. I mean, it, they become the hot spots because now more nutrients would be of level uh, for environmental <coughs> um, conditions like runoff or leaching uh, or even nitrous oxide emissions uh, into the atmosphere. The another important BMP is the uh, four R's. Uh, four R's are the practice of right rate, right source, right placement, and right timing. So application of right rate is extremely important. And, and again, it is important from an economic standpoint as well. I mean, this is a graph on the right that you see. Uh, uh, on the X axis, uh, there's a nitrogen application rate. On the Y axis, it's dollar per unit area. Of course, you look at the red, the fertilizer cost. You know, you can keep adding fertilizer but it's going to cause a linear increase in, in the total um, cost of your uh, inputs, right? The green uh, bars, they, they represent uh, the yield. Of course, when you're adding fertilizer, um, the yield is going to go up. And, uh, but the problem is, you know, you're also incurring additional costs, right? So that's why the economists have come up with a but with a point which we call as uh, economic optimum rate. So at what point, you know, you are gonna get the maximum economic return is, is called as economic uh, optimum rate. And that's the nitrogen recommendation that most of the agricultural universities provide, uh, especially when you see that on a SOLTUS report, uh, that's what is written and that is called as economic optimum rate. The other four R uh, is the right placement. I mean, these days fertilizers are expensive. So you may, you may be thinking about, should we ban it? Should we inject it or should we broadcast it? The next uh, best man practices under 4R is the right timing. You know, you don't want to put all your fertilizer upfront because if you do that, you basically increase the risk of loss. And research has shown consistently that there is a beneficial effect on yield if we do a split application of fertilizer. The other important BMPs to consider is to avoid applying any manure or commercial fertilizer uh, when there is a flash rainfall war. Um, uh, uh, rainfall uh, warning, uh, you know, should not be putting uh, fertilizer at that time because it's going to flow out um, from the agricultural land. The next one is the source. Uh, speaking about source, you know, many people think about what is the right source to use? Should we use fertilizer? Should we use manure? So when it comes to manure application, you know, you need to be considering that it is highly heterogeneous and it should be tested before application. You know, if you are using manure, uh, there are laws uh, that, are gov that govern like what rate should be applied. You know, for example, NRCS 590 guidelines and P index should be used uh, when using manure. Uh, the other important BMPs that is extremely important is adoption of conservation practice. I mean, these days, a lot of farmers are moving towards a no-till or a minimum till system, and that helps to prevent erosion, uh, especially the soils moving into the agricultural lands, uh, moving from agricultural lands into the water bodies. The next is adoption of filter strips around the waterways, riparian forest buffers, grass, waterways, wetlands, you know, windbreaks. I mean, these are some of the excellent conservation practices that keeps the uh, uh, 
the nutrients running into the waterways. Finally, in summary, I would like to say that in order for a sustainable nutrient management and be a great environmental stewardship, it starts with manure and soil testing. We need to adopt 4R practices. They are highly effective in improving nutrient efficiencies, preventing economic losses and environmental problems. And finally, adoption of conservation practices are extremely instrumental in, re in reducing nutrient losses in the environment. With that, um, I'd like to thank you for, for your time. Uh, and if you have any question, you, uh, feel free to send me an email um, and I'll be happy to talk about it. Thank you. So Rishi, uh, are there any um, demonstration areas or demonstration locations, uh, if you can answer uh, very quickly, uh, where farmers can uh, learn more about this and then especially in commercial horticulture side of things, what, what do you see uh, you know, the implications? I mean, one of the main thing is, you know, the fertilizer application rates, you know, that should be based on, on, on the recommendations. I mean, that is one of the best ways to start or thinking about preventing any nutrient uh, you know, losses or reduction into the environment. We also have as a part of the conservation uh, you know, demonstration, we have our ongoing CIG uh, grant that where we are demonstrating the effect of uh, adoption of cover crops into the no-till system, uh, adoption of cover crop basically to reduce nutrient losses and how does that improve the water quality. So we do have three sites in Alabama, uh, but they are all in the row crop side. Uh, from a commercial horticultural uh, you know, standpoint, I don't think we have any project, but I feel like the principles are the same, irrespective. I mean, whether it's a row crop system, whether it's a pasture or forage production system, or even the horticulture system, uh, the principles stay the same when it comes to nutrient management. 